Today I'm going to be talking about aniline-based pain and fever reducers, which have had an interesting history. The first to come along was acetanilide, which was sold under the brand name Antifebrin. In 1886, its effect was discovered serendipitously when doctors ordered a parasite medication but were accidentally sent acetanilide. The doctors had no idea, and they went ahead and treated their patients. It did absolutely nothing to get rid of their parasites, but the doctors noticed that it reduced their fevers. They were very surprised by this, so they contacted the company again and ordered a second batch of the same thing. This time, they actually got the right medication, so the parasites were treated, but the fevers weren't affected. At this point, they were pretty sure that there was some sort of mix-up, so they did a little bit of investigating, and they found out that they were sent acetanilide instead. Acetanilide had never been tested in humans before, so this effect was a completely new discovery. At the time, there was very weak drug regulation, so it was quickly made available to the public. However, it was eventually taken off the market due to toxicity issues. It can lead to unpleasant things like liver and kidney damage, or methemoglobinemia, which is when hemoglobin has problems releasing oxygen to tissues. About a year after acetanilide was discovered, another company started to sell a different aniline-based pain reliever. At the time, they were producing a lot of P-aminophenol waste as a byproduct in dye production. And the chemists at this company thought it might be possible to convert it to something useful. So what they did was tack on an acetyl group to the nitrogen, and they covered up the hydroxyl with an ethyl group. This gave the final molecule para-ethoxyacetanilide, which they called phenacetin. However, just like acetanilide, it was eventually found to be problematic. In humans, it was linked to an increased risk of death due to urological and renal diseases, cancers, and cardiovascular diseases. Also, it caused some people to have hemolysis, which is the rupturing of red blood cells. Chronic use could also lead to severe kidney damage. In the US, it was eventually banned in 1983, and other countries have banned it as well. It took quite a long time, and nearly 50 years after the release of both of these drugs, it was confirmed that they're both just pro-drugs. In general, pro-drugs are inactive, and they need to be metabolized to form the active molecule. So in this case, they were mostly just being metabolized to paracetamol or acetaminophen, which is the active molecule responsible for the pain and fever reducing effect. And it turned out that most of the dangerous side effects were just being caused by other breakdown products of the pro-drugs. With this discovery, acetanilide and phenacetin were eventually completely phased out, and now acetaminophen is the only aniline-based pain reliever that's available. Although acetaminophen is better, its possible side effects are still concerning. It's not directly linked to cancer, hemolysis, or methemoglobinemia, but it can still severely damage the liver. In low doses, less than 4 grams a day, it's supposed to be safe for the average adult. However, higher doses, sometimes not even that much more than the recommended amount, can lead to liver failure. It's the number one cause of acute liver failure in the Western world, and it's one of the most commonly overdosed drugs. Anyway, what I find interesting about all of these pain relievers is how very small structural differences can greatly change the side effects of a drug. By just adding a hydroxyl to acetanilide and removing an ethyl from phenacetin, we go from drugs with potentially fatal side effects to a relatively safe one. In my opinion, this kind of highlighted how difficult drug design and development can be. The human body is an incredibly complicated system, and it's really hard to predict exactly how something will interact with it. It is unfortunate, but it's the reason why we absolutely need to use animals in drug research. In the end, it's either the life of a rat or the life of a human, and I guess we've decided that humans are worth more. Anyway, on that note, I'm gonna end things. I'm not exactly sure what the next video posted to this channel will be, because I imagine it's going to be pretty intermittent. However, don't be afraid, I'm not going to neglect it like I did before, and I am actually going to start posting more often.